I want us to hang on to the passion that we have for teaching and the passion that we have for learning. I want us to hang on to the real sense of connection and community that we have at Anne Arundel Community College between our colleagues, between students and faculty. I want us to hang on to that sense that working together as a team, we can accomplish anything. Welcome to Redefine You. I'm Dan Baum. Join us as we continue to explore what happens when we're challenged to change our thoughts, beliefs, or even who we think we are. Music has been called the universal language. How do we teach and perform music in our current online world? Why is it important to continue learning and engaging in music and the arts? In this episode, we'll talk with Doug Byerly, an associate professor in our performing arts department. He'll share the ups and downs of online performing arts and how music in particular can build connections and feed souls. I want to welcome Professor Doug Byerly, who teaches music at AACC. Hi, Doug. So good to talk to you. Thank you, Dan. It's great to be here. How are you holding up during this pandemic? You know, uh, like many of our students and our colleagues, um, there's a little bit of a uh, uh, fatigue from teaching online and doing a lot of the the Zoom and Teams and all the things that we do online. But I will say that this term in particular, I've, I'm re-energized because I, I'm teaching one live class. And that section in particular has just really buoyed my uh, my attitude and my it's, it's really given me a, a lot of uh, positive uh, 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 vibrations for the, the, the future at AACC. That's good to hear. I want to dig into a little bit about that further. Let's let's start with pre-COVID. What did you primarily teach and what other activities did you lead or were you involved in? So pre-COVID, I was the director of the choirs. I was directing concert choir and chamber singers. I was heavily involved with theater as a collaborative effort between the performing arts department, uh, theater, dance, and music. I was involved with producing our production of Beauty and the Beast, uh, along with uh, my colleagues from theater and dance, Sean Urbanke and Linda Fitzgerald and Anna Benoweg was on, were on the team, as well as a lot of community members. I was teaching music theory and music fundamentals, uh, and I was teaching conducting and composition. So there, there's a, a wide range of things that I was teaching and, and activities that I was involved in. Uh, along with that, uh, I'm the general director for Opera AACC, which is one of only uh, three companies in the nation that uh, offer opera on the community college level. So you didn't have a whole lot going on is what you're saying. <laughs> <didn't> you? <laughs> so, so COVID comes along and you're all about performance, live, interactive. What have you been able to do during COVID? During that time of uh, COVID from March 2020 until really till now, uh, we've been developing online technologies and, and working with uh, various partners so that we can actually have an ensemble uh, or a, a, a vocalist or a clarinetist play in real time with another musician uh, that's 50 miles away, 20 miles away, 100 miles away. So, uh, you know, in Zoom, if you try and talk uh, at the same time, it becomes uh, a lot, just a lot of garble. Uh, however, using some of the technology that we're employing, uh, we have 10 students singing online together in sync in, in real time. It's, this is not a virtual choir where they each record their part and then dub it all together. This is actual music making happening uh, online. It, it doesn't replace what, what we do live, but it's, it's pretty darn good. That's so cool. So tell me a little more about that approach. Like what you say, technology tools, best practices, what are you actually doing to make that happen? So um, through the CARES Act, the college was able to help students that couldn't afford the technology. That is a, a USB microphone and a good set of stereo headphones uh, and an Ethernet cable as well, because um, Ethernet stability is very important in this process. So the college has helped support those students to uh, at, at their home so that they have a dedicated computer, dedicated Ethernet connection to their modem, uh, a microphone, and headphones. And then they're 
able to use an application that we're using called Jam Kazam. So we create these virtual rooms that allow our students to interact with each other. And we, we do have video as well, so we can actually see each other uh, and, again, sing and perform in real time. That sounds really cool. I, you said that the live class you're doing now has been really energizing. What, what do you find is uh, makes that so energizing compared to this cool technology you're using? Yes. <laughs> as cool as the technology is, in my opinion, there is nothing that beats meeting face-to-face -face live in a performing arts class. The human connection is so important. When we're uh, currently, uh, every Friday, I'm meeting with uh, Chamber Singers, which is a group of nine singers who registered for this class. And we have protocols that we follow, obviously. And we're, we're following the best practices from the CDC and other, other sources. But uh, in meeting live, you really have to consider... Uh, the spacing within the classroom, uh, the airflow, uh, and the return and refresh rate. So in a two and a half hour class, we meet for uh, approximately one hour. Then we all go to individual practice rooms for about 30 to 45 minutes so that the room can refresh. And we come back and sing for another hour after that as well. And then we depart. We're wearing masks the entire time. We're using distancing. We're use following the ventilation pattern of the room as designed by the engineer. Uh, so, it, what, but in meeting live, I get to see the uh, eyes of the singers and they can see me. We get to hear each other in an acoustical space uh, and really perform and truly in real time. And it, it's, it's magical. It, it's really, it's the best. And it, it's, it's motivated all of the singers in the class. And it's given them hope that, yes, we can see down the road that we'll be able to sing with maybe 20 singers at some point or maybe 50 singers again at some point. I'm curious your thoughts about arts organizations as a whole, because obviously COVID is having a, an impact on arts organizations and live performances in general. So what are you, what are you seeing there? I see um, a lot of innovation happening uh, with arts organizations, particularly in our area with the theater, uh, with the symphony, uh, and, and, and various performing arts organizations. Don't get me wrong. Uh, we're struggling. Uh, as a former board member of the Annapolis Symphony Orchestra, uh, I, I applaud their uh, innovation in terms of offering live concerts that are streamed so that people can still watch, heading towards the, the point where we can have audiences back in the hall and still stream really high quality performances. Further, the uh, I'll just use the symphony as an example again. They have a, an academy that they're really reaching out to young people, and they're continuing to do one-on-one -on -one lessons in a socially distanced fashion, and you're really following the science, but making connections with elementary students, middle school students, and continuing to build that that community of artists. To the point of your question, uh, arts organizations in 2021 have to be innovative in the product that they deliver and the way that they, the modality that they deliver it. But they also have to be looking towards where are we going? You know, we all say we want to have a sense of normalcy uh, after COVID, but uh, I, I don't know that we'll, we will ever have a, a, an opera company or a dance ballet company in the same fashion that we knew two years ago. I think that they're going to really have to be looking at uh, audience development, who's coming to these, these events, and figure out ways to really continue to grow and be innovative. That term normalcy, it, it's striking to me because we sometimes say new normal or returning to normal or some sense of normalcy. So if if you had a crystal ball, what, what would you say that will look like for arts education, music education, and, and the arts as a whole? Well, uh, there's several things that are informing arts education right now. And the, the, the return to normalcy is highly overrated. In fact, uh, I think we... This is COVID has given us an opportunity to shift the paradigm and, and look at uh, arts education through a, a new lens, through the lens of the 
of anti-racism through the lens of decolonizing the music room, through the lens of incorporating and embracing um, more than just the Western tradition. And every arts educator has, uh, I'm going to call it a mandate to really look at what and how we're teaching and who we're teaching and, 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 and truly uh, listen and open our ears and our hearts to the, the process of anti-racism and decolonization. I love that perspective. And you have such a broad perspective because you wear many different hats, obviously. There's another one, uh, your role as musical director, I believe, for the oldest Catholic parish in the state. Tell me about your experiences during COVID in that role. Well, th thank you for asking. First of all, St. John uh, the Evangelist in Hydes, Maryland, is celebrating our 200th anniversary. And in fact, uh, in two weeks, Archbishop Laurie will be coming out to kick off the, the heritage uh, of this 200th anniversary. Wow, cool. Uh, I love St. John's because it's a just an open, welcoming community. And uh, the, the music is vibrant, the liturgy is vibrant, and uh, it's, it's a community where I've, uh, over the last year, had the opportunity to continue to build the, uh, the performance side of the music by doing things like uh, involving limited number singers. Uh, we designed specialized booths for singers to contain aerosols so that uh, we can be safe singing at a liturgy. We've been live streaming every week as well. And our audience uh, for live streaming has been uh, anywhere from 150 to 300 channels locking in, which means that could be anywhere from 150 to 500 people or so watching every week. I would, gosh, I would think that the two experiences are informing each other as you're teaching and working with students online and then how you bring that to your experience as musical director for the, for the parish. Absolutely. Uh, I, Dan, I, I love teaching and I love uh, working in the music business. As it turns out, um, many uh, AACC students have had the opportunity to work professionally with me as contractors at St. John and for the Archdiocese. Uh, so I'm a huge uh, believer in mentoring our students and, and showing them the professional opportunities that are available for singers and musicians. Well, for many, myself included, music and performing arts is itself a spiritual experience or act. What are what are your thoughts or observations there? Uh, I would agree with you. No matter uh, whether you're agnostic, atheist, Jewish, Muslim, uh, Christian, music is one of the core uh, soulful experiences that we embrace uh, in humanity. Uh, I was listening actually uh, uh, this past week uh, to some uh, Mongolian uh, contemporary music, but it embraced throat singing, which was a very cool style, along with uh, the stringed instruments and percussion from the, the, the Asian uh, tradition. And it was just, it blew me away because I, the soulfulness of this music remind me of uh, Mumford and Sons goes to Mongolia. Okay. It, it just truly, and I'm not trying to be pedantic. I, I, I really, there was just this really uh, genuine, organic, beautiful sense. And, and I, even though I couldn't understand what was being sung, I understood the music. I understood the connection and it, it touched me. So indeed, music is soulful. Music is, for many, a, a religious experience, whether it's sacred, contemporary, it doesn't matter. What are you hearing from students about their being able to engage in the arts at this time? I think it's so important for uh, our students, from what I'm hearing, to be able to have the human connection on a regular basis. Uh, whether we're in the visual arts in a, in a ceramics class, whether we're in a dance class, a theater, uh, music, uh, our students long to just be in the same space as their mentor and their colleagues. Uh, and if it means maybe meeting one, one week live and then two weeks online, they'll do it because that the, the need, the desire and the, the the real sense of connection when we meet face to face 
uh, in the arts is a very powerful thing. And I think our students, a lot of them miss that. At the same time, you've been able to make connections without being live. I mean, my, my immediate thought, many people might think that by not being in person for live performance, it's easy to assume there's a loss there. But I'm hearing such excitement from you and that there are possible gains and opportunities with the technology itself. I think that uh, if we use this technology that I've talked about, uh, uh, we can incorporate this technology in a hybrid sense into our work. So you know what? A snow day can actually be a make music day. Oh, I love that. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) Uh, uh, But uh, colleagues and students that can't travel can still access a class and participate. Uh, we, you know, we have students that cross over the Bay Bridge and come from uh, uh, quite a ways away, sometimes an hour, an hour, 20 minutes to, to come to Anne Arundel Community College for their arts class, right, for their classes in, in general. And, you know, some the times uh, if, if they know that they can actually participate, uh, it might be easier on that really uh, terrible rainy day or they, they might be feeling a little bit under the weather or have even... God forbid, uh, pre-COVID symptoms, they could actually still participate in the class. And so we can have live singers along with uh, virtual singers in real time. We are focusing on the future of education this season. We've touched on a lot of this already, but I'm just curious, what do you want us to hang on to most as we move forward with education? Uh, I, I, that's a... A double-edged sword, Dan. <laughs> uh, because <Okay. laughs> I'll share with you. Uh, I want us to hang on to the the passion that we have for teaching and the passion that we have for learning. I want us to hang on to the real sense of connection and community that we have at Anne Arundel Community College between our colleagues, between students and faculty. I want us to hang on to that sense that working together as a team, we can accomplish anything. I want us to hang on to the the really the high caliber of content and teaching and Uh, that we have. I want us to hang on as well that there are various modalities that we can teach and learn in. Not everybody is uh, designed to learn online. We we get that. But quite frankly, there are students that thrive in an online environment. So I want us to hang on to the technology and resources that we're building. I I think there's a lot of things that we can hang on to in education. Uh, But I think there's a lot of things that we need to observe and be Um, aware of as educators and within the community that we need to grow and to uh, let go of certain things from the past as well. And some of those things, uh, we we need to let go of anything that uh, blocks our students that uh, in any fashion that, uh, so we want to embrace, again, um, this concept, not just concept, the entire uh, movement of anti-racism of decolonizing the classroom and looking at who benefits from the theory and and the content and making sure that all of our students have equitable and access and uh, just are uh, truly creating the most inclusive, equitable environment that we can. Do you see this as a a redefining moment for the arts or arts education? And if so, how? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, one of my former students, Alicia Lee, happens to be the executive director of the Maryland State Department of Education Fine Arts Department. And we've had uh, Alicia Lee come to uh, campus virtually over the past year to talk to our students about how arts education is changing. And uh, whether we're talking at the high school level or the college level, uh, each of us has to look at um, an entire uh, sh- this shift, uh, including the repertoire that we choose, the content that we're talking about and using, uh, whether it's in theater, in dance, in music. So the performing arts has always been, in my mind, at the forefront of uh, being inclusive and equitable. Uh, but at the same time, there are times where I've seen the arts be very uh parochial and enclosed in that sort of conservatory fashion where if you're not good enough, you don't get in. And uh, 
uh, there, there, there's always this cutting line. So I think we're seeing a shift in that sort of attitude in that approach. Something you said earlier about arts organizations really struck me, and that is innovation while at the same time recognizing and facing struggles. And I would, I would argue that arts organizations, when they're at their best, are at the forefront of that as well, innovating while acknowledging struggle. And what I would like us to hang on to is a recognition of how important this is for our souls as we recognize that we need connection. And this is one of the ways that all of humanity connects is through music. Hallelujah, brother. <laughs> I'm quoting Leonard Cohen here, right? <laughs> but truly, Dan, you're absolutely right. Uh, the struggling artist, the struggling arts organization, uh, by its very nature, is generally innovative, creative, collaborative, and and indeed, it touches the soul of, of humankind. And thus, it is, uh, in my opinion, uh, Sometimes uh, I, I refer back to, uh, I think it was Arthur Brundle who said, Beethoven is my religion. And, and so uh, music, dance, theater have that ability to touch the soul and to make us laugh, to make us cry, to make us feel, even in times like COVID. Well, we're talking about organizations. Our theme is also redefined, of course. So how about yourself? What has been a redefining moment for you or how have you redefined yourself over time? I uh, have redefined myself throughout my career in many facets as a conductor, as a performer, as a teacher, as a collaborator, mentor. Um, this past year in particular, the redefining moment has been uh, like many of my colleagues, how to incorporate technology and still touch students, how to reach our students and really make connections. And I've opened myself up and redefined myself as uh, even though I don't like teaching online, I'm going to do my best to use any and every resource so that the students can feel connected so that they, they're, uh, able to see that they can do this. And so the redefining of Doug Byerly is that uh, I, I am an online teacher. I'm a live teacher and I can wear both hats and, and make it work. You weren't always a college professor. Is that correct as well? Uh, no, I, I spent uh, 16 years in the public schools. How has that informed your teaching as you have evolved in, in the way you approach it? Well, uh, not only my teaching uh, uh, in high schools and in, in performing arts magnet schools, but I, I taught elementary and middle school as well. But I also taught as an adjunct at, at the college level. And those two things, teaching in the K through 12 system and teaching as an adjunct inform me greatly on the experience of what it is to be a high school music teacher, the experience of what it is to be an adjunct and um, being a uh, full-time professor, uh, I, I hearken back to those sensibilities. So I know the importance uh, that adjuncts and that K through 12 teachers need in terms of support. And so for me, uh, it was an awareness that, hey, I need to go down to Broadneck High School or uh, to Severna Park High School or to Annapolis High School or, or reach out to various schools throughout the county and make connections with those teachers just so that they know that, hey, AACC is a, a great place. We know it's a great place, but we need uh, other people to know that as well. Uh, and as an adjunct, it, it's also uh, it gave me that information of really being a supporter and an advocate for our part-time instruction team because they're amazing. And they're really the part of the lifeblood of this community and of our instructional team. Well, obviously you and I are big advocates for performing arts and you mentioned K through 12. Many of those programs were being cut or reduced pre-COVID. What do you think is going to happen post-COVID? Are people going to recognize as you and I are talking about, this is vital or, or do you see that, that it will continue to erode? Dan, I wish I could uh, wave my magic wand and assure you that- I'm going to uh, give you the magic wand. Just wave <laughs> it, Doug. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm waving. Uh, the, uh, we know 
the importance of arts education for K through 12 and beyond. We know the importance in terms of the correlation and the relationship between academic studies and brain development and the arts. We know that uh, communities that have thriving arts programs generally have thriving athletics programs and have the thriving academic programs. They go hand in hand. If you start cutting the arts, you're cutting academics as well. If you start cutting the arts, you're cutting athletics. If you start cutting the arts, you're cutting the soul of the entire K through 12 system. And it's very short-sighted for individuals to think otherwise. Then it must be cutting biology too, because it just cuts our hearts out. That's what I would add. <laughs> here, here. Doug, it's it's always great to speak with you. I, you know, I wanted I do want to say on a personal note, um, as you know, my father-in-law passed away uh two years ago. It was actually two years ago last month. And I've shared this with you, but I just want to share uh publicly. My family arrived at the church. And I should point out, it's not a church that you attend. Um, we, we go to different churches. My family arrived, and who do we see at the piano is you. I just have to say, your music, and probably even more importantly, your presence was just so comforting and so beautiful, Doug. It was just, it was really, it touches me still. Dan, thank you for that. Um, it was an honor and a privilege for me to celebrate your family's life and, and, and loss and grief and be part of that. And, 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 you know, for our students, that's what we do as musicians. It's part of the healing process. So I'm, I'm thank you for saying that. That was just a, it, it, it stays with me as well. Well, thank you for all that you do for our students, colleagues, and community. Take care and be well, Doug. Thank you, Dan. Music truly has the ability to speak to us all. It can give voice to our pain and sorrow. It can also express joy, love, and healing. One of the news stories that sticks in my mind from the early days of the pandemic is that of people in lockdown cities playing music from their porches and balconies. In particular, Broadway star Brian Stokes Mitchell singing the impossible dream to essential workers in New York City. Others played instruments, sang, or banged pots with wooden spoons. The point was not rehearsed proficiency, but the uplift that comes from creating art and experiencing togetherness in the moment. Music is at the core of who we are. As I sit in my home office, surrounded by guitars, speakers, and art on the walls, as we look hopefully toward an end to the pandemic, it's a salve we can embrace regardless of location, education, or beliefs. So sing a song, watch a virtual performance, and support the arts. It will do your soul some good. Redefine You is a production of Anne Arundel Community College. Our executive producer is Allison Baumbush. Our producer is Jeremiah Pravat and our writer, Amy Carr Willard. Others who help with this podcast include Amanda Behrens, Angie Hamlet, Ben Pierce, and Alicia Renahan. Special thanks to Doug Byerly. Find show notes, how to subscribe, and other extras on our website, aacc.edu slash podcast. I'm your host and creator of this podcast, Dan Baum. Thanks for listening. We won't get in trouble over this. can one guy be I kissed her and she kissed me like a fellow once said ain't that a kick in the head her room was completely black I hugged her and she hugged back like the sailor said Cut, ain't that a hole in the pole thank you Thank you very much. <laughs>